Okay. All right, cool. Um, so just before I begin, um, when I was putting together these two presentations, the, the first one was meant to be level 200. It wasn't meant to be level 300, so it was meant to be a high-level overview. This one I was going to go into more detail, and I was planning to do all demos, basically, of, of the advanced threat protection stuff. Or sorry, advanced, the, the four big features, advanced threat protection and ASM and those sorts of things. Um, because those have been out for over a year, though, and because I was able to get access to some demo resources for the new pieces that we're doing, what I've done is I've tweaked the deck a little bit. I'm still going to go through the slides and talk through advanced security management and advanced threat protection and that sort of thing. But where I was going to do a demo, I've actually put a link out to a recording from the Ignite 2016 conference so you can watch it in your own time so that I've got more time to actually focus on advanced data governance and um, threat intelligence. So if you were coming particularly because you wanted to see ATP and, and that's a concern for you or something like that, you want to just watch the videos in your own time, completely understand if you want to go and watch another session. Um, otherwise, uh, hopefully we've got some good stuff for you and I'll take you through the, the threat intelligence demos and the advanced data governance demos, which you won't have seen because I only got them from the product group yesterday. Um, all right. So for, for the sake of the people that weren't in the room yesterday, I thought I'd just do a quick recap on, on some of the security and compliance pieces. Um, you, you may have heard our Microsoft security story before. It, it's probably just worth going through. You know, typically, we, we see these concerns from, uh, from our customers um, across the industry in general. These are potential blockers for, for adopting software as a service. You know, going from outside the, the uh, or going outside of the, your network environment to a cloud um, does carry some security considerations, does have some compliance implications. So, you know, oftentimes those are things holding people back. Um, we know that you need to trust us in order to, to adopt these services. You have to put your data into the platform. We can't do anything without the data. Um, we're not using the data for anything else. You know, we're, we're making these commitments to you about how we manage that. But we want you to, to, to trust us so that you can use the service. And in order to earn that trust, we focus on these four areas. Um, so we talk about security and how we protect the service and the controls we give you to put additional security in place. We talk about the privacy of your data and what we use the data for and those sorts of things. Um, obviously, compliance standards and transparency in the operations and management of the service and, and all of those sorts of things. Um, again, customer challenges. Just as context for why we've done some of this, this focus on security, um, we're seeing lots and lots of records compromised and, and the cost of that being on average about $4 million for a data compromise these days. So you know, we want to put significant effort into helping our customers deal with that. The threat landscape is getting more and more complicated. We're not seeing the traditional sort of attack where you, you, you see an attack coming and you deal with it you know, then and there. Potentially seeing environments being compromised and nothing happening for days or months or you know, whatever sort of time period. And then it's very, very hard to detect people once they're inside the environment. People using their own personal accounts. Not because they're trying to be malicious, but if they want to do work and you're not giving them a way to do it that's, that's officially sanctioned, they'll go and find personal services that they can use to collaborate with people. So what sort of challenges does that introduce? The growth of data and, of course, the compliance standards across geographies as well. So Microsoft is uniquely positioned to deal with these, we believe, because we control um, the platform. We have the intelligence capabilities that result from that, and we have strong partnerships. So again, very, very quickly, in terms of platform, you know, we have the identity um, in Azure AD. We have the control of the devices and being able to manage devices. We have control of the apps and the data itself and the infrastructure. And that looks like this. Um, obviously, here today, we're looking at things on the Office 365 side, so advanced threat protection, customer lockbox, um, and some of the, the other pieces have been talked about before as well. And we'll go through what, um, what we're going to be doing. In terms of intelligence, I just want to quickly mention this idea of the intelligence security graph. So because we have all of that, um, the, the signals available to us through the platform control, you can see there's a lot of different things that we get exposed to. We get information on uh, unauthorized data access or malware that's coming in or all the um, antivirus and, and oh, sorry, viruses and, and spam and those sorts of things coming through the services. So we can get a lot of intelligence out of that that we can put into our, our network and, and start making decisions on. What that looks like is, you know, to give you an idea, we're talking about um, 300 billion user authentications each month. So when we're looking at what's a suspicious logon, what's suspicious activity, 300 billion user authentications a month is a pretty good data set <coughs> that, we can, that we can learn from. A billion Windows devices updated, 200 billion emails that we're analyzing for spam and malware. So we're spending about a billion dollars a year on security and research development alone. Um, it's Microsoft's actually quite a big security company, it's just a lot of people don't know about that. Um, so from a partner perspective, we have strong relationships with partner community, uh, uh, partner organizations and, and add-ons to the services. We work with industry alliances and we've done a lot of work with governments through the, the transparency programs and that sort of thing that we operate. 
So when we're talking about reinventing productivity, we're talking about this idea of digital transformation. It's no longer about what sort of capabilities do we have in the product, what can Excel do or what can Word do or can we do co-authoring in a browser. We're really looking at how do we expose these, these ideas of collaboration and mobility and intelligence in the products with that underlying um, nature of uh, level of trust to the services. So I didn't mean for this to be a product pitch. I just wanted to talk about the advanced capabilities in general and they fall under the E5 SKU. So really, I'm not gonna talk anything more about licensing other than to say that these things can be purchased as part of E5. E5 became available on the 1st of December in 2015. So that's why I was saying advanced threat protection, advanced security management, advanced e-discovery and customer lockbox have actually been out there for over a year. So there's a lot of information on those. Advanced data governance and threat intelligence are capabilities that we've recently announced or we announced at Ignite last year. Um, we've just announced they've gone into private preview and you'll see those being available in the next couple of months. So that's why I wanted to try and focus on those today. All right, so advanced threat protection. The problem we're seeing with traditional antivirus um, solutions is that because they, they rely on a signature, they, they can't really deal with these zero day attacks. So a zero day being something that you're seeing for the first time, there are no signatures available. So you've got that period of time where you can be compromised before the antivirus vendors release the updates for their environments. Um, you know, similarly, the other side of it is once the, the vendors do release the, the, the update, the attackers can change the campaign. So they might be sending out a URL that might look good for, for the period of time, and then they start changing things so that they point to malicious targets afterwards to try and you know, avoid detection, change things back to these safe UR, um, URLs. A and these can happen very quickly. They might run a campaign just for a space of a couple of hours, and then things will be fine again afterwards. So it, it's very dynamic, and, and it's a challenging space for traditional security. Now, we don't want to just come up here and say advanced threat protection is the answer to everything. It is a layered defense. We, got, we recommend a defense in depth strategy. So you can see um, everything there from operating a firewall on the host itself, moving out to having backups of your data. You, um, you do want to make sure that you are backing up the data. We have a great white paper on how we do data resiliency in Office 365. It talks about versioning and, and recovering from a uh, ransomware attack um, to you know, the, the capabilities built into the product. Um, some analytics, which is basically what we're talking about today with the product. Antivirus, anti-spam, we have Exchange Online protection as part of every Exchange Online li uh, license. Um, advanced threat protection sits on top of that so that you get the additional capabilities to do that, that uh, zero day sort of protection. And then of course, educating the workforce is still a really, really important step. Um, you can't rely on technology alone. You need to be out there talking to your people about you know, what does a potential phishing campaign look like? You know, should you be responding when you see an email that seems to be from the CEO saying, please transfer $25,000 to this account? You know, is that actually a legitimate thing that the CEO would do? So our threat management strategy, uh, you can see um, basically falls into these categories. The bottom two being the exchange online protection piece, which we're not gonna be talking about today. Um, the first four being categories or, or capabilities that advanced threat protection deals with. So again, advanced threat protection. This is our solution for um, protecting against zero day because it gives you the, the time of click protection against the, um, the files themselves sorry, the, the URLs, and we're doing protection against malware through machine learning and analytics on files. So we're not relying on a signature to look at a file and say, yes, this is infected with a virus. We're looking at the behavior when we go and run that file to see what's happening with it. And of course, rich reporting as well, so that you know who's actually clicked on this link or who received this file um, and, and, and being able to explore that. So the first capability is, is this idea of safe attachments. So essentially what happens is with advanced threat protection, we still pass through all of the Exchange Online protection filtering. So we're gonna do our checking for known ma uh, malware. Um, we're doing heuristic scanning and that sort of thing that, that ERP has built into it. So it's really, once it gets through all of that, you can go, it goes through um, advanced threat protection. You don't have to do this for every user. You can filter it out and, and scope it down to particular users if you want to. But if you have ATP turned on for a user, what we do is we take the attachment out of the email and we spin it up in a series of virtual machines and we run that file to see what happens. So um, is it writing to the file system? Is it going out and trying to download software from a network location? Is it um, trying to detect whether it's running inside a virtual machine, which in itself could be a suspicious activity? So once we've done that, we can make a determination as to whether or not the, the file is, is something that we wanna keep. Um, and we have the ability to, um, to, to go ahead and control that. So I'm gonna show you very quickly this one. Um, ATP is actually pretty simple. You go into the security and compliance center, you go in and you define a policy for advanced threat protection, and you can see the options are, are fairly basic. Once I turn it on, I say, what do I wanna do with the file? Do I wanna block? Do I just wanna monitor? Do I wanna um, actually you know, 
<coughs> sorry. Um, yeah, do, um, do I want to, sorry. Do I want to block the file? Do I want to take the attachment out? Essentially, I'm going to delay delivery while this attachment's coming through. I can set where the alert's going to go. So if a user receives the file, do I want to notify an administrator that this has happened? And, <coughs> sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and then the, the, the user's going to receive the, the notification. Of, so this, the administrator gets the notification of the, um, the message. So we can still see that detail. What I was going to say is we have dynamic delivery, which was missing from that other slide. So we added dynamic delivery just recently to the product. So dynamic delivery, essentially what happens is because we're taking that file out and we're running it inside of a series of virtual machines, it's going to take some time for that, that inspection to happen. So it slows down the delivery of messages. When we have our mailboxes inside Office 365, because we're controlling the scanning environment and the mailbox environment in the same place, we can actually do some things where we can deliver the message but put a placeholder in for the attachment so we don't see the actual attachment. Though so the user wouldn't see the actual attachment. They'll just get a message that says we've taken the attachment and we're scanning it in um, advanced threat protection. If we determine that the file is good after that, we can go back, we can edit that message and replace the placeholder with the original file and the user's fine. If we determine that it's bad, then obviously we, we don't deliver that file, we notify the administrator. But it means that you know, we don't have that, that couple of minutes delay now, if you're using, you can use advanced threat protection with on-premises mailboxes. Um, the, the challenge there is that we have to hold the file while we do that inspection, and it means the email delivery is, is delayed by you know, a minute, two minutes, three minutes, whatever that might be. So dynamic delivery, if you've got mailboxes in Office 365, I would definitely recommend you look at put, uh, turning that on. The second, safe, uh, second capability that APP does is, is something called safe links. So anytime it sees a URL, inside the email, it will actually rewrite that URL so that instead of um, going to www.contoso.com, we send the user to safelinks.microsoft.com slash www.contoso.com. What this means is that every time the user clicks on that email, we go back to the ATP service and the ATP service can do a real-time check against the replication list to see if we know that that URL is bad. So that's really addressing the second part of that, that malware campaign. The user, or sorry, the, the attacker sends something out for a couple of days, they leave it pointing to a, a, you know, a relatively safe website, nothing's happening, it doesn't look like it's bad. Um, and then at some point they point that at a, uh, a malicious payload. Um, because we're doing that time of click protection, we will know through the reputation list changing that that's bad and we can block the user from getting to it. We can also see that every time the user's hitting that, we're re recording the users clicked on that link. So we know who's actually clicked on the link in the time period before we, we started blocking it. If you want to, you can allow the user to go through. Um, probably wouldn't recommend that but it is something that you can do. So safe links again is, is pretty easy to configure. You load up the policy, you basically say turn it on. Um, you can use it to scan downloadable content, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, obviously we want the tracking. You can also tell it not to do particular URLs if you want to, if you don't, if you have, if you find that you've got internal URLs that you trust and you don't want it you know, redirecting back to the service every time or, or if it's causing some issues, you can certainly wh um, whitelist particular URLs. We don't have a blacklisting capability. You can't add your own things to safe links yet. Um, that is something that we've looked at and uh, you know, maybe coming soon. But um, today you could still do that through a, a transport rule or something like that. So basically what that means is that when a user clicks on a, a link inside a website, um, they'll be taken to a page like this where it will say it's malicious. Now you've got control over whether or not they can continue through or you just block it completely. But because this is inside the message itself, this means we're getting this sort of protection on any device that we're using. If I'm on my phone, if I'm on my PC, if I forward this email to somebody else, we're still going back through ATP, doing this real-time check and getting blocked. So URL detonation I is another capability that we added recently. Basically what this means is when we have a URL that points to a file, so rather than sending um, the payload as an attachment to the message, we have a URL in the message that says go out to this website and download the file. So what we can do now is ATP will actually follow that link when you click on it, it'll go and get the file, it'll take that file and put it into the, the sandbox environment or the de detonation chamber. Um, it will run that, see what happens and uh, prevent the, the user potentially from getting to it. So what that looks like is, you know, say you've got your Outlook client here um, and the user has, has provided that link to that PDF file at the top. So we click on that and we'll get this message pop up um, in our browser that's basically saying that the link is being scanned. It'll take ATP a minute or two, come back and we'll be able to get to that file or we'll be blocked completely depending on what the result of that is. 
ACP has some very rich reporting. So again, um, the, the idea that you can get in and see how much are we blocking, how is it, uh, how effective is it being, how much are you being targeted by malware in your environment, and who's affected. Um, and you can see the, the different file types. So we'll actually grab Office files, PDF files, executable files, and we'll spin them up in virtual machines ranging from different versions of Windows Vista to, to Windows 10, you know, IE 8 to IE um, 11, um, Office 2007 to Office 2016, different combinations so that we make sure we're covering our bases as best as we can. And then finally, you have the message trace capabilities as well. So if you really want to know what's going on, you can run a message trace. And so we can see here that the files come in, um, it's going to be replaced by advanced threat protection. Um, so you can see it running through dynamic delivery kicks in here. So the message is delivered, but the attachment's going through ATP processing. And then you can actually click on in the next one and see the results of that ATP scan. So you can see in that case, we've got a Windows 7 environment with Word 11, um, you know, another Windows 7 environment with Word 12, those sorts of things. So, so this is actually giving you some insight into what ATP is doing, the virtual machines that it's running. There's some additional information that you'll see through the threat intelligence capability as well um, in the next few slides. We have internal tracking data on, on where ATP has been useful or not, or sorry, or could have been useful. So these are just some statistics that we generated internally over a three month period. You can see that if customers had ATP turned on, we could have caught an additional 35 million more zero day messages, um, catching you know, 10 to 15 million more zero day messages per month using detonations. So in terms of what's next, ATP has, uh, has started as really an email solution. It sits behind Exchange Online Protection, it's protecting your email. But you'll see ATP expanding out into the rest of Office, into OneDrive for Business, into SharePoint Online. Threat Intelligence, which I'm gonna go through in a minute, and Threat Explorer uh, are gonna give you some more insight to what's happening with advanced threat protection. And we have a spoof intelligence capability as well, which is actually live today. You could go and see that if you wanted to. So let's just quickly talk about what it means going beyond email. From a, an Office 365 perspective, with SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business, Moving beyond email essentially means utilizing the, the safe attachment capability. So when you save something into OneDrive for Business and you save it into SharePoint Online, um, ATP will go and crawl that file. It'll take it out, it'll put it into a detonation chamber, run the file to see what happens. If it's bad, it will actually change the, the icon on the file and lock it down so that only the person who uploaded the file can see that it's in there. Nobody else will be able to see that file inside that SharePoint site or OneDrive for Business. So it's really gonna stop it propagating out through that mechanism. For the Office clients themselves, we're talking about the, the safe link capabilities, the idea that we go and anytime we see a link, we go and check on that link um, through the reputation list. And then we have some pretty significant integration with Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection. Um, you may have seen a, a session on that here as well. But being able to follow a malware campaign as we see results on a PC, we can see how the data came in through email, who might have been affected, we can look at where that, that compromised one have flowed to. Um, a lot of integration across the stack because of that intelligent security gap that we're tying into. So the spoof intelligence capability is, is live today. If you have an E5 tenant or if you go and set up an E5 trial, you can actually see this. Um, essentially what it is, there are some times when spoofing might be legitimate. You know, you, you might have newsletters that come out where you want it to come from your email address or something like that, but it's produced by a third party. So spoofing may be something that you want to allow in some limited cases, but you don't want somebody just randomly spoofing your, your domain. So with this, we can actually set a spoofing policy um, and we can get some information on, on who is, is doing that as well. So you can see here, uh, I can turn the policy on, which is pretty simple. And then I can click on the link at the bottom and see who's been spoofing. So it'll give me that particular user Oh, the, the spoof user account, it'll give me the number of messages that have come through there. Um, anytime we've had complaints come back by people reporting through the, the office clients or the message admins themselves, um, and whether or not we are gonna allow that, that spoofing to, to process or not. So as I said, I'm, I'm not gonna do a demo of advanced threat protection. Um, there is a, a full session on advanced threat protection from Ignite 2016 uh, that has much more time than I do to go through all the details and, and to be honest, probably a more engaging presenter. So have fun, go and check that out in your own time. Um, if you have questions, obviously, we're happy to go through that as well. So advanced security management. Um, again, you, you've seen these, basically these ideas before. It's, it's really just to, to show you this is what we're thinking about. This is why we're moving towards this capability. People have concerns about moving to software as a service. You know, you're, you're putting data outside of your firewall where traditionally you've, you've been comfortable with it. We don't know what employees are doing with the data. We don't know who's got access to the data. Um, so, you know, those are legitimate concerns. 
Advanced security management is one way that we have of giving you additional visibility and giving you additional control over that environment. So ASM um, has a, a few capabilities. We're very much focused on threat detection as it relates to Office 365. So we have some capabilities for you generating alerts and looking at how people are utilizing the Office 365 environments, giving you some control over that as well. So some security policies and things we can use to, to clamp down on activity and discovery and insights. If you've got Office 365 out there, uh, you want people to be using the Office 365 services, you probably want to know what else is going on in your environment. Are people actually using that or are they still using third party services? We don't want to have agents installed to monitor that. We can do that directly with the SOC 2 logs. So from a threat detection capability. <coughs> so again, this is used when the, the data that we're getting through the threat intelligence, um, the, the intelligence security graph. We're looking at things like how people are signing in. So we're getting signals that, that maybe somebody's coming in through a Tor browser or they're coming into an anonymous proxy or they're coming in from a, um, an IP address that you've ne never seen before, an ISP that you've never seen before. Things like that that might be suspicious that you might want to generate an alert on, especially if they're logging in as an administrative account. ACP looks at all of these signals and it can identify patterns and put these together and then generate a, a risk assessment based or a risk um, um, assessment based on that. So maybe these activities on their own are not necessarily suspicious, but when you tie them together in a pattern, that could be an, a potential campaign that um, you're being targeted with. So here's an example of that, an anomaly alert. You can see in this particular case, we have a user who's, who's triggered a suspicious session. So ASM has decided this has got a risk score of 86%, which is a high severity incident. The reason it's come to that conclusion is because the user's connecting from an anonymous proxy. The user is an administrator. The user is signing in um, from an ISP that's not only the first time you've been used in your organization, but the first time any administrator's ever been on that ISP connecting in. The administrator, the person has, has um, set an email forwarding rule, which is quite a common activity that we see in, in uh, uh, attacks on the environment. It's the first time that's happened in 82 days. It's only been done 20 times in the past. So this is not something that occurs very often. This is quite a suspicious activity. When you put it all together, this is quite a serious risk. So you know, we can generate that alert, we can go out and talk to that user, we can find out what's going on, or we could actually say, automatically disable that user's account, force them to change their password, you know, at least that's a, um, a first step to controlling the damage, and then we can go and do an additional investigation from there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Right, um, so again, we have the ability to define some policies inside the environment that are gonna give you insights. So these could be things like somebody's downloading large amounts of documents to try to extricate data from your organization. Would you necessarily know about that otherwise? Um, you know, what activity is a user doing that might be suspicious? The mail forwarding is, is one good example. So you can see there's a policy here. Um, this one is for mass download by a single user. Um, so you can configure the action for that, the activity type. How much do we want that to happen? Is it just a, an isolated event? Somebody's downloading a lot of files, maybe they've got a new computer and they're synchronizing their content, or are they periodically going through and saying, take all the files from this site, take all the files from that site, take all the files from that site? So again, do we want to just generate an alert? Do we want to kick in, block that user's account, uh, stop them from logging on and, and getting access to that content? The next piece is app permissions. So this is giving you a view of what applications are, are connecting into Office 365. Now you can drill into these applications and get more information on them. So you can see that um, there's a, a permissions level associated with it. You can see the, um, the number of users. Basically what we're looking here is, um, do you want that application to connect to Office 365? We can even go in here and stop it entirely if we don't want that. So we can look at the application, we can look at where it's running from, um, what sort of activity it typically does, and potentially stop those users from, from utilizing that application, connecting to their mailbox, pulling data out, whatever they might have authorized for that to do. And then the discovery and insights is really looking at the, the usage, determining, detecting shadow IP. So again, utilizing your proxy logs, we can generate this productivity dashboard. Now ASM is the, the, the smaller version of cloud app security. So in ASM, we're very much focused on Office 365. We've got a productivity dashboard. We're looking at productivity applications. Cloud app security, you can go beyond that. You can look at all sort of applications. But really, this is giving us the ability to look at what are people doing inside the organization? What other mail services might they be using? What other file sharing services might they be using? Again, we can get a view of the risk of that application. So if somebody's, if we're seeing a lot of traffic and a lot of users going to a file sharing site, and that, you know, we can look at that, that application, we can drill down, we can see where it's hosted, we can see what sort of um, 
security compliance standards they have? Do they meet ISO 27001? Have they done SOC audits? Or is this a, a web service running in somebody's basement that we've never seen before that, that could be potentially risky? So again, a lot of insight that you can get out of advanced security management for that capability. As I said before, not gonna do a demo. Great session out there that you can go and see for advanced security management. So this is where I think it starts getting really interesting because we have this new threat intelligence capability that's gonna come in the next couple of months. So threat intelligence is, again, leveraging the security graph, taking all the information that we're seeing, taking information that you're providing to us, like what sort of industry are you in, um, you know, being able to provide proactive defense. So it's, it's quite complicated to set policies that, that will protect your environment. You know, it, it, it takes a lot of time to figure it out. You don't necessarily know exactly what you wanna do with it. You know, with it, things like threat intelligence being able to, to integrate into the suite, we can suggest policies and even potentially go down to the, uh, to the point of enacting policies for you if you wanted to. That would allow you to protect your environment based on what we're seeing with other customers or out there in the industry in general. You know, the, the integration we talk about, it's this idea of connected signals. So I can see that this particular user is, is um, accessing some files that might be infected with malware. This user's being targeted by a phishing campaign. So based on those sorts of things that we're seeing, that user might be um, infected, compromised. So we might have ring fence that user. We want to potentially go out and block the user account. We want to force them to change their password, maybe get them to do a multi-factor authentication um, so that you know, we're limiting the damage. We're, so we're not cutting the user out entirely. They can change their password, they can do an authentication, they can get back into the environment and do a bit of a cleanup themselves. But you have that capability to enforce things like that and, and really con um, stem the flow of the damage. So as I said, threat intelligence, we're taking into account attack trends, we're looking at all the attack trends, we're looking at all of the different intelligence points we're getting from our consumer services, from Office, from Azure, um, you know, from, external security hunters, people who do this professionally, um, being able to suggest capabilities to you. So we'll go through the demo and I'll show you that. Okay. So this is the security and compliance center. Um, you can see we have some widgets surfaced in here, but really the intelligence is gonna come from going to the threat management console and going into your dashboard. So straight away here, we can see some information on how effective our protection is being. So our catchment rate for malicious messages blocked by Office 365, 99.9%. .9%. The daily threats that we're seeing, we've got 162,000 emails coming through and 84 of those have malicious content that's being removed after delivery through ATP. So, you know, this gives you a good sense that your, your system's actually working, it's actually doing something. We can see some data on the, the attacks that we're getting targeted at us, where those attacks are coming from. So the heat map over in North America and over Europe. Um, we're also getting some in, uh, information surfaced in here in the widget on top targeted users. So maybe we can go and uh, look at what those users are doing or apply some additional protections to them or whatever that case may be. The other thing we can do is, oh, sorry, this will go. Down the bottom here, you can see we've actually got some information on the global catchment rate. So the global catchment rate for all Office 365 customers, 99.96, or sorry, 99.6% and some information on how many messages are being delivered daily versus um, files being blocked by ATP globally. So again, it gives you an idea of how are you going compared to other customers on Office 365. Let's go and look at the Threat Explorer. Now this data is all of the, the malware or, or attack um, uh, spam, as that sort of thing that's being targeted at your environment. So you can see over the period of time the, the different um, pieces that are coming through there. Again, you've got that view on the, the top threats that you're seeing, who's being targeted. This is interactive, so I can go and I can hover over um, and get some additional details on that, some additional details on here. And we can actually go and filter this as well. So if we filter this based on the time, um, so if we look at the, oh no, what is it, the 20th, I think. Uh, where are we? back to here, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, okay, so you notice that as I'm clicking, we're getting the updated view here and here. So it's, it's dynamic, it's updating that view so we can filter it down. And the more we refine, the, the closer we get to that view. So if I clear, um, so let's go and filter based on the threat. So this one, 
So now we've refined it down to this particular track, which is the um, uh, nematode, uh, uh, yeah, um, whatever that malware happens to be. So you can see again that we've refined it right down. We've got a spike in activity happening on the 24th of January. We can see exactly how many attempts we're getting across our tenant and how many users are being targeted for this as well. So from here, I can go through and I can get some more information on that. So I'll come over here and just click on this. And that can bring up a detailed report. So I can see here that this is a, uh, a script downloader. It's typically a zip file um, that puts a, a JavaScript payload onto the machine. It doesn't really do much itself, but it goes out and gets other malware and it installs that on the machine. Under the users, I can see not only who's received it inside my organization, but the actual subject of the message, who sent the message, the sender IP, and what the status was. So in this case, we can see that we've been quite fortunate. We've blocked all of the deliveries or it's been delivered as spam to the user's junk email. If it had actually gotten through, we would see that and then we'd be able to go and follow up with the user as well. If I want to get some more technical information on this, um, so I can see, if I wanted to, I can come in here and I can click on this and I can get some information on that one in particular and get a white paper. But I can see that typically it's associated with the Locky ransomware. So I might just go and look at that one instead. You can see we're accessing this um, malware report from Microsoft Threat Intelligence. So that'll go through and give you quite detailed information on what we're seeing. And that would be obviously for, for anything that, um, that surfaces here. All right, so let's get out of that and go back and have a look at some of the global details. So from this particular environment, you can see where the blue in the, the graph here and the orange is global Office 365 customers. So we're not actually being targeted by this malware as much as other customers are. Um, you, we can see down the bottom the impacted countries. This is mainly lighting up in Europe, uh, sorry, in Germany and the United States. It's mainly targeting services and manufacturing industries. And then the next one is, we'll go and do some advanced analysis. Now this is where I was saying that you would see the details that we're getting through advanced threat protection, the information on what we're actually, um, what we're actually doing when ATP takes us and runs it in the sandbox. So these are files that have actually come through ATP. We can see the individual details of the files, the behavior that we saw when that file was run through the sandbox. So it ran a suspicious command, it dropped a file into the temp folders. Um, you know, it, it's got some known malware that it's detected for ransomware. So we got the hits on those particular um, signatures. The operating systems and the Office client versions that we executed against inside the virtual machine. And then how long it actually took for that analysis to take place. So again, this is where I'm saying, if we've got two minutes and 23 seconds for that analysis, that's why dynamic delivery and having the mailbox in Office 365 can be useful because the user's not sitting there waiting for two minutes and 23 seconds for that email to actually land. All right. So, um, so the next thing I think is we're going to go and look at some alerts. So we'll look at the alerting capabilities we have. And just before we do that, I'm going to create, before we look at the existing alerts, we can go through and we can um, create a new alert. So you can see we've got the ability to put the name in. Um, pretty simple, there's a category for threat management. We're gonna say for inbound malware activity, how often do we want that to fire? Um, when it becomes unusual, you can see it's gonna take some time for actually to, to build that baseline. So we'll set that. And then who do we wanna notify? So the administrators inside the organization, what's the severity, do we wanna limit? And then review it, turn it on, off it goes. So you can see there's some alerts here that we've already defined. Um, and I'm gonna just go through, I can see that the number of times that actually occurred, but we have one here for an unusual volume of delivered malware. So let's go and look at that one in a bit more detail. Okay, so again, we can see that it was detected and blocked, but you know, we have 48, message, um, 48 instances of that message coming through. Okay. All right, so, Yeah, as I said, so that's the, the threat intelligence capability. Um, that one you will see landing, as I said, next couple of months and um, yeah, okay. I'm gonna move to customer lock locks. So customer lock locks, we talked about a little bit yesterday. Um, if you haven't seen it, customer lock locks is a compliance solution. Essentially, nobody has any standing permissions to Office 365. Anytime that we need to get access to your data, 
it's typically in response to a, a service request, something that you initiate, because all of our operations are automated um, and, and done specifically so that we don't have to take direct action. This, this is not like running servers yourself. We can't have people remote desktoping into computers. We don't want people touching customer data because of the, the sensitivity of that. So really, customer lockbox is an extension of the lockbox process that we use when we need that, that access. In order to get access to customer data, you would call support, you'd open a ticket. Um, the Microsoft engineer is going to determine that they need access to data to fix it. There's no automated mechanism that they can utilize already. So they'll go and make the request into the system, which will go and do a bunch of checks to make sure the user's authorized to make that request. And they've got background checks and se required security trainings up to date and all of those sorts of things. The lockbox system will then route it to a manager and a manager goes and does the same verification. Do we actually need to touch customer data in order for this to happen? If the manager determines it's okay, then the access is approved uh, and the engineer gets access to customer data so that they can fix the problem. Now it's a time limited access. Um, they can only run the very specific PowerShell commands that they requested, so it's a nice secure environment. It's all completely audited and visible to you in the activity log of the tenant. Um, and these do get reviewed every month by the VP of engineering because we don't want this situation happening. We, we, we want to go back and look at why did we need to have manual intervention into the system? What can we do to automate it so that we've got self-healing capabilities or it's not necessarily again, not necessarily again. So you get visibility through lockbox, um, but for our highly regulated industries, we understand that you want a little bit more control. You want to have the final say over whether somebody gets access to your data. And that's why we did customer lockbox which is essentially the ability to insert yourself into that process. So after the manager has determined that yes, we need to, to give the engineer access to the data, um, it will generate a, an email out to the administrators of the customer and say, you have a new customer lockbox request, please go to the portal, sign in, um, and you'll be able to go in there and you'll see those details. So we won't send it to you as an email, we just click on the email, we instruct you to go to the portal and sign in in a regular way, uh, and then you can see that detail and you can authorize it through there or reject it. If you reject it, we don't get access. If you don't respond within 12 hours, you don't get access. So this is really giving you the final say in that access to your data. Today, it's any administrator of the tenant. Uh, there, is a, um, there will be a capability coming where you'll be able to designate certain people, which is good from a separation of duties perspective. You've got people logging help desk tickets. You've got somebody in compliance or security who has the final say, yes, we want that to happen. No, we don't want it to happen right now because we're on change fees, whatever that might be. The customer lockbox is pretty simple. There's not a lot to demonstrate. Um, but again, I would refer you to this session from Ignite 2016, um, which will have some, some information on that. Advanced data governance. So with, with data governance, we, in the past, we've really focused on this idea of preserving content. We, we know we have legal requirements or we want to be able to recover deleted files. So it's really just been about protect the files. And you know, we've, we've done things to give you more and more space so that you don't have to worry about protecting the files. We've got ever-increasing mailboxes, and we've got five terabytes of space for OneDrive for Business. So really, it's been a case of, well, why don't we just protect everything and leave it in the environment forever? And on one hand, that's good because we're not going to lose anything. But on the other hand, that introduces its own challenges. You know, we've got all of this extra data sitting around that could carry significant risk to the organization. If we're in a discovery situation, we're potentially going to have to filter through that data to determine what's relevant. We're going to have to hand over additional data for a, you know, a long period of time for that. Um, or it could just be data that could leak out of the organization and we don't necessarily want it to be there. So all th this, essentially this idea of, of putting some governance around the data is, is certainly growing in, um, in focus for us. Traditionally, what we see is people would do a third-party outsourced journal. And there might have been reasons for that in the past. You know, you want a separation of that, that capability. You don't want an administrator to have the ability to go and delete something. Um, you want a backup of the content. But there's also challenges associated with that. You know, we, we've seen migration issues when customers want to move to Office 365. Um, we've seen issues where the third-party system can go down or the link can break. And now you're getting systems like that aren't capturing the, the, the full record or we get edits in this environment uh, in Office 365 that aren't reflected in the journal. Or it could be a som sim something as simple as this is another environment that's just sitting out there that somebody else has access to. So it's another potential ex um, exposed point for your data. So rather than the, the traditional approach, rather than having that, that copy of your data, which is going to increase costs, what we recommend in Office 365 is an in-place data preservation strategy. So we're going to keep the content inside your mailbox. We're going to keep it in a secure part of your OneDrive for Business site. So we don't have duplication of that data. There's only one copy. We still protect that, that data. We're still going to make sure that we capture every, ver every change to that so that we're not going to have 
um, you know, legal risks where, where files have been changed and we don't know about it. Um, we're going to make sure that the, the data is protected and stays with the user. The nice thing is that we can actually do this and keep all this, the data on Office 365 and you don't have to pay for it either. So it's um, for you, when the users leave the organization, you can take the license away, give it to somebody else. We're going to keep that data in the environment. You can have it running there. No more costly on-premises systems to maintain data for 20 years for people who've left the organization. There's a couple of ways we can do this. In the past, we've talked about litigation hold or a legal hold, which is basically that idea that we just put a policy on and protect everything for that user. Um, or we have the, the query-based holds, uh, which give us a filtering capability. So rather than holding everything, I'm only going to hold content that's relevant to the investigation I'm doing. So particular keywords for, for a merger or an acquisition or something like that. Or I'm going to hold content based on um, a time period. And we have new preservation policies in Office 365 that make that easier for you to do. In terms of what it looks like, just to, to help you visualize, from an Exchange perspective, if you're talking about the user's mailbox, Inside the Exchange mailbox, you obviously have your folders that you can see when you go into Outlook Web App or into you know, Outlook on your desktop client. There's a whole section of the mailbox, though, which is this, this orange piece here, the recoverable items folder, that the user has no access to. The only way to get to that is through the, the programmatic methods, the, the e-discovery channels and those sorts of things. So what happens when something comes in is that a message gets delivered to the inbox or a particular folder, whatever it might be, based on rules. If a user deletes that, it goes into their deleted items. So, so far, all good. If the user deletes it from deleted items, though, it looks to them like it's gone, but what we actually do is move that item into the recoverable items folder, and now we're preserving it there where they can't touch it. So the user thinks they've deleted that message, but it's actually sitting inside the mailbox for whatever period of time you've defined, and you can go and use eDiscovery to pull that back to recover a deleted item. You can go and do an eDiscovery search to take that item for you know, uh, investigative purposes or legal purposes or whatever that might be. Um, sorry, the, that's deletions, they can, is, yeah, delete, Sorry, I'm getting confused. Deletions is there so that um, once they empty the deleted items, it goes into deletions. What I was talking about is purges. So when we've deleted it, the user thinks it's gone, they've emptied their deleted items folder, it goes into the purges folder. We can hold that depending on what they're doing. The other side of it is that if we've got editing of the message, we store that in the versions folder. So again, this is an immutable archive. We have a record of every change that they've made. We can keep that nice and secure. We have tested cases of this in, in um, where it's been used in court in discovery circumstances. So, and we have industry compliance standards like SEC regulations, a white paper from the SEC that says this, this meets the preservation requirements. From a SharePoint perspective, when you create a SharePoint site or a OneDrive for Business site, we actually generate a preservation hold library, which again is, is something that the user doesn't see. It's hidden in the background. So that means that if the user deletes a file um, from any location, we're gonna keep a copy of that in the hold. When we have a hold defined, um, the hold will actually prevent the site from being deleted. So by having files there and having a hold applied, even if you take the license away or you try to delete that user's OneDrive for Business account, the hold will prevent that from, take, from taking place. This is quite a complicated slide, but essentially it's just saying that we have the data in the middle there inside Office 365 for the various services. You have the ability to bring data in so that you can um, preserve that with the rest of the Office 365 data. I've got on-premises archives or I've got data from other systems that I want associated with that. I can bring that all in, preserve it all, and have that single source for, for my, my data um, retention. And then do things like doing e-discovery or, or having some activity alerts across that. Where we are today, we have the ability for you to do drive shipping or, or network upload. So you can take your data that's on premises or in a third party archive, you can bring that into the environment, we can ingest it from there. We also have partners that will give you connectors into third party systems. So if you want to bring in um, twit, uh, uh, Twitter information or LinkedIn posts or Facebook posts or whatever it is for a user, there are partners that can take that data and bring that into Office 365 and you can preserve that essentially in the user's mailbox um, so that you can then do e-discovery and, and that's looking across it. We have some unified retention policies that we've added to Office 365 now. So you don't have to go and say, I've got this particular retention I want for Exchange versus this for OneDrive for Business. I can go into a single location and say, preserve all of my files for seven years or 20 years or whatever it might be, and, um, and, and that will go and apply. We have records management capabilities, which I'm not gonna go into. As I said, we have the SEC 17A4 white paper um, that talks about the capabilities there. And then we have all of this delivered through the security and compliance center. So that's what we have today. What we really wanna talk about is what we're delivering through advanced data governance. 
So you have these capabilities, you can go in, you can say, I know because I'm subject to a particular regulation that I want to apply this policy, um, but that's fine if you know it. Advanced data governance is about surfacing information, about suggesting capabilities to you, about recommending things that you might want to do based on, again, your industry um, or, or what you might be focused on. The, the value, the data itself, running machine learning or, or um, classification across the data and giving you suggestions so that you're not just treating everything as the same thing. All right, so this one is, is kind of simple. Um, we go through, okay, I can actually walk through this one. Um, so this is the, this is the, again, security and compliance center, the home of that. We start seeing some of the, the widgets appearing on the home screen there, like the importing data. But we'll go in and we'll look at the data governance dashboard. So again, you can see here, we have some information on your tenant. We can see that 82% of our users have an, uh, an online archive mailbox. Um, what I should have mentioned before is that archiving and retention and preservation are completely separate ideas. So archiving is purely about storage management. Retention is about protecting the data. So you may not need an archive. The retention one is probably what we're more concerned about, the 68% of users inside the organization that we have retention policies assigned to. You can go in there and you can see we can cover more users. We can put more people on hold, protect more of that data. Um, but I think in this particular case, we can see up in the top here, recommended to you, it's telling us that we've got data that's ready to be imported. So we've, we've shipped it on a disk or we've done an upload into an Azure vault. That data is now ready to be imported into the system. So we'll click on start importing data and we'll, we'll start looking at bringing that in. So straight away you can see it's done, and done an analysis of your data and it's telling you that 44% of the data that's sitting there ready, ready to be imported is over four years old. And surveys have shown that most people don't need data after about two years. So it, it already got you thinking, do I actually want to do this massive import of all this data or can I start filtering it down? So you know what, let's do some filtering. It's going to give me an option up here, one, two, th four years, seven years. Um, and by saying that I want to do four years, I've cut my data import in about half. So when I do that import, you can see the results there, how much data will be imported if I do it. I can go off and we can do it. It brings in 35 gigabytes of the 62. We can still keep the, the rest of the data there for 90 days. So if we want to come back later and say, you know what, I actually wanted seven years of data after all, we can come back, we can run this again, we can bring the rest of the data in. Otherwise, we can just let it go and it'll expire out. So the next thing is, um, you can see here that on the right-hand side, based on what we've told Office 365, oh, sorry, um, the, the one above it, based on what we've told Office 365, we've said that we're in the healthcare industry and we're in the United States. So uh, advanced data governance is saying, you probably need to look at HIPAA compliance and preserving data. So it can go straight through there and help us create a policy to maintain HIPAA compliance. The other one underneath that though is retained tax records. So it's actually gone and looked at our data and it's found that we have data inside SharePoint Online or OneDrive for Business that comprises, um, or th that is made up of tax data. So it's got that information on what tax data looks like using the sensitive information types that we have through data loss prevention. It's found that content and it's saying we can create a policy for that. So rather than me having to go back and say create a policy, I want to preserve content that's of this particular sensitive information type, I can just click on that policy and it's coming up and telling me that I probably want to keep that data for 21 years so it's not accidentally deleted. I'm just going to focus on the data that has the W2, 1040, 1054 and other tax forms and I can click create and that's it. It will go off. You can see here it's telling me that it's creating a policy and it's running and setting that up. I haven't had to do anything else. It's suggested all of that to me. It's going and putting a hold on content only that meets those particular data types. So I'm not holding everything in somebody's mailbox. I'm not holding everything in OneDrive for Business for 21 years. I could have a policy that says across the organization, I want to keep data on the whole for seven years. But if I've got content that meets this particular tax um, classification, the tax data is going to stay for 21 years. Everything else just stays for seven years and then it can expire out. Okay, so we can go and create some tags so we can tag our own content if we want to. If we go and look at one of the tags that's there already, you can see we have this tag that is called competitive research. We've said we want to do a five year retention um, and that we want to actually delete the content as well. So again, this idea that we don't want content sitting around after it's no longer relevant. We can say, keep the content there for five years, but then after five years, automatically go and purge that content out of our environment. So simply by tagging our content then with this category, we've automatically enforced that not only protection, but also the deletion of that content later as well. Okay, um, so the next one is creating a retention policy. 
So, you know, whatever, create a name, set the location, we can go through and just have it automatically apply to all of Office 365, or we could choose to do just specific locations. So you can see here we can get in and we can say particular SharePoint sites or particular mailboxes or OneDrive for business accounts or whatever that might be that we can filter on. And then we can say what we want to do with it. So I want to preserve my data for seven years. This is that blanket sort of protection capability. Or we can also tell it that after seven years it should go and purge the content. So what we get with, with, with standard Office 365 capabilities is the idea that we put a policy in place for seven years and we'll protect that content. But after seven years, the, the item, if I've got something sitting in my inbox and I have a policy that says protect it for seven years, in seven years and one day, nothing's going to happen to that item. It's still going to sit in my mailbox by default, right? Because I haven't deleted it. It's sitting in my inbox. Um, if I've deleted it, then the, pr the policy comes off. That item's no longer protected. It expires out. But if it, if it hasn't been deleted, it'll sit there. So with this capability, we can actually say, actually force that deletion, purge that content, get rid of it from the environment. Or we can simply do a... Um, you know, a, a, a rule there as well where I can delete it afterwards. Uh, so some advanced retention. Um, again, this is where we can say particular sensitive information types. So I've not only filtered down based on the location, particular Exchange users, particular OneDrive sites, but I can filter on the data as well. So you can see here when I go to add a data type, the drop down that comes up is the 88 sensitive information types that we have available through data loss prevention. So for us in Australia, uh, you can see there we've got bank account numbers, we've got driver's license numbers, we've got medical numbers, or, you know, Medicare numbers, passport numbers, those sorts of things. So I don't have to worry about, again, preserving all of the content that's out there. I'm not really worried about all the files that people are putting into OneDrive for Business, but if they've got something that includes bank account numbers or passport numbers or any sort of sensitive information, we want to preserve just that information. And it's very easy for me to set that policy. The lock policy down the bottom I think is really interesting. As part of that SEC compliance, we had to implement a preservation lock capability, which is basically um, we don't want the situation where an administrator can be coerced into turning a, a hold off. You know, you can imagine if you've got all this content on hold and you know you've done something wrong and you go and you, you um, bribe the administrator into turning off the policy, all that evidence gets destroyed. That's a big problem for the organisation. So when you define this policy, if you edit that and say lock the policy, that policy stays there for as long as you've defined. If you've said keep data for seven years, that policy is on for seven years and nobody can turn that off. And when I say nobody, I mean nobody. You can't call Microsoft support and say we put this on by accident. That, that policy is there for the next seven years protecting that data, which is great from a security of the content perspective because nobody can turn that off. That's always going to be there. It's always going to be protected. But it does mean that it's something that you think through very carefully before you turn that on. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, similar sort of thing. This is basically setting a global retention policy we could do. And those, are the, so yeah, so those are the capabilities that we have coming as part of advanced uh, data governance. I said um, that's in private preview right now. It is going to be coming in the next couple of months. Those are the capabilities we're focusing on delivering at launch. So if you're interested in that, you'll be able to see that through an E5 trial or, or your E5 licensing um, over the next couple of months. Advancing discovery. So, yeah, we, we talked about this, um, this idea that the data is increasing. So how do we actually protect all of the data? How do we meet our compliance requirements? The costs of non-compliance are pretty, pretty significant. You can see there a $9 million fine for failing to produce data. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a challenge to, to filter through relevant content for e-discovery purposes. It's very expensive to filter through the content as well, especially when you start looking at sending data out to outside counsel to manually review to see if it's relevant. So these are some of the things that we, we took into consideration when we developed the e-discovery capabilities. So the Office 365 e-discovery solution, um, we, we have it built into the product running across all of the services. Obviously litigation was the traditional focus, but we're seeing e-discovery being used now as well for things like internal investigations um, or regulatory requests. So things like being able to search across your data and say, show me where people have credit card data stored. Not just, you know, is it in the environment, but show me where that is. I don't necessarily have to export that out, but I can run that report through the e-discovery engine. So the, the typical e-discovery flow, we want to preserve the content. We want to identify what's actually relevant. And then you can start using the tools to filter down to reduce the amount of data that you have at the end to, that you're producing for, um, for you know, a legal discovery or, or whatever the case may be. 
Just some examples there of what you could be using it for um, outside of litigation. Again, you know, we talked about the, the um, investigation for HR purposes or, or whatever instead of internal purposes, um, identifying relevant data, collaboration, all of that sort of stuff is there. With Office 365 today, you have rich search capabilities. So you have the ability to basically define queries. So you, you put in the queries that you want, you use keywords. You can see we're getting some results coming out of it. So if I run a, um, a query across my environment looking for the word uh, cheat, I'm gonna get 12 hits. If I'm looking for fraud, I'm gonna get 11 hits or um, 11 locations with this many items with this much data. So we can, we can refine those queries. We can, because we've got that predictive um, result coming back, we can sort of refine it down before we actually go and do the, the production of that data and export it out and you know, utilizing one of these three options. We can either export it out in the native format, so anything that's in OneDrive for Business or SharePoint, we just dump those files out. Anything that's in an Exchange mailbox, we export into a PSP file. Um, you can export it with the analysis. So the, the, the left-hand side, the native export, is probably like an internal investigation. If you're moving data from one place to another, or you just wanna get it out of Office 365, you can do it with that. Um, the export with analysis, we can bring all the content through with it, the, the, um, the metadata and that sort of thing, so that we can probably tweak it internally. And then we have connections, um, we can export it in a format that we can take it and import it into a tool that's used by third party, or sorry, that's used by legal organizations. So law firms would typically have their own very specialist tools they use for filtering through the data to figure out what's relevant um, and, and then producing that for a trial. So we can export straight out of Office 365 into this tool. We have a, a really good white paper that was released just a short time ago on how we do e-discovery at Microsoft and how we're saving money utilizing these tools so I definitely recommend you go and get that. It's available through the, um, the Office blogs or the Trust Center or that sort of thing. So the focus with advanced e-discovery is really on um, how do we refine that data even more. There's only so much you're gonna get when you're doing keyword searches. It can be quite difficult to filter through large volumes of data and get relevant results back based on keywords and to refine based on the, the queries. It, you know, it's, it's a good step, but it can be difficult to, to get actual data. What we're getting with, um, with advanced e-discovery is machine learning and training and predictive coding that we can utilize to not just look based on keywords, but look at the content itself, look at what's relevant, and then automatically analyze other things and suggest them into the environment. So we can identify relationships between the data and then use detection algorithms to um, reduce the duplication. So essentially what that's saying is that we have the you know, the, the first step is really identifying the data that you want. You want to put that on hold, um, collect all the, the relevant sources. When we go and look at that data, in the past we've done the ad hoc search. I've said maybe I think this location's relevant. Is it advanced e-discovery can actually expand that scope and use the themes and start figuring out, you know, this other content that wouldn't have been included based on keyword searches alone becomes relevant. This will include that in the, the result set. From there, we can start training the system. It gives us um, it gives us documents that we review. So we look at this document and say, yes, this is re relevant to what I'm, I'm interested in, or no, this one's not. And then based on the, the set um, that we review, it can tell us how many documents we need to review to get a, a stable content set, um, or you know, maybe we go back and, and change some other things. And then finally, once we're happy with that, um, we can do that final production, we can do the deduplication, export that out in a structured sort of format. So again, in the interest of time, I, I cut my demo for that one. Um, you can go and see a video recording that talks through that. So I had time left over for questions. Um, hang on. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, so I have some time left over for questions. In terms of resources, um, the blogs are still the best place. When we do announce search threat intelligence is available, when we do announce advanced data governance is available, you'll see that through the blog, you'll see write-ups of it. So I would definitely recommend you follow the blog. Um, the Office 365 roadmap is there as well. The new Trust Center is available. And again, uh, as we said the other day, we've got information specifically around the different types of roles um, and white papers and audit reports and capabilities that you might be interested in. And then there's the Ignite Learning Path. Please do your evaluation forms. Um, you need to get wristbands for the party tonight, I guess. And you won't see me on the speaker lounge because I'm going to the airport, but if you've got questions, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit or please feel free to email me. So hopefully that was still relevant, even though I cut most of the demos out of the environment. You know, the, the threat information, or th sorry, threat intelligence, advanced data governance, I think is, is quite interesting. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for coming to the session. <laughs>